you heard about the man that owned the bakery and uh, he was very, very profitable so that people said that he was rolling in the dough. <laughs> All right, I can't have a good joke every week. Come on, now, this is... <laughs> Today I want to talk about great gain, great profit, great profit. And uh, Jesus had something to say about that. He said, for what will it profit a man if he gains, there it is, the prophet, he gains the whole world and loses his own soul? That is a real mind-sobering question. What will it profit me if I gain everything? But in eternity, I wind up in perdition. Whoa, that's a powerful thought. What will a man give in exchange for his soul? The answer to that is you can't give anything in exchange to, for your soul. You can't. Is there anything that there is in exchange for a soul? And the answer to that is yes. Jesus Christ gave it all. He died on the cross. He was buried. He rose again. But on the cross, while he was dying there, he was paying the wage of sin, our death. He took our place. He died the just for the unjust. And he made an exchange of his soul, his life on the cross for our lives. And if we accept him, there's been an exchange made and I've gained everything. Keep that thought in mind. Because <clears throat> it's not the words of Jesus I want to focus on today. It's the words of the Apostle Paul. And it's this, godliness is great gain. I get it in 1 Timothy chapter 6, verse 6. He says, but godliness with contentment is great gain. Did you get that? Godliness is great gain. Now, this is found in a context where there are some false teachers. Notice here that it doesn't say that, but godliness with finances is great gain, but godliness with contentment is great gain. Great gain is not found in finances. It's not found financially. It's not. Because in the context, even though false teachers are teaching, that's what Paul's refuting here, that godliness means financial gain. I don't know, you've probably watched them on television. I saw the ad the other day, a man selling holy water, holy water. And if you buy this holy water, it is pretty much guaranteed to make your life healthy, wealthy, demon-free. It's called the prosperity gospel. They are peddlers, peddlers. That, that if, you, if you do something, you know, religiously, that godliness is a means of financial gain. That's what some people teach. That, that hey, if you, if you accept Christ, everything in your life is going to be wonderful and better. Tell the Apostle Paul that, who was beaten, he was shipwrecked, he was bit by a serpent. I, wow, that sounds really like a promising career that he took up, huh? Everything's going to be wonderful. Not necessarily. That you're going to get rich. Now, it's, it is true. It is true that Abraham was a wealthy man. David was a wealthy man. They weren't wealthy because of their faith. They were saved because of their faith. And God promises to give us everything we need for life and godliness. So we covered last week. All right? That... that Everything we need, God has promised us for life and godliness. Even though the false teachers are teaching that godliness is a means to financial gain, he says it is not, but godliness with contentment is great joy. Well, why isn't the financial, why, why, why isn't it that, that godliness brings you well, financial prosperity? Why isn't that's the great gain? Well, there's good reason, he said, for we brought nothing into the world and you can take nothing out of it. Finances are limited. I've seen a lot, and I've done quite a few funerals, but I've never, ever seen a hearse go by pulling a U-Haul trailer because everyone knows you cannot take it with you. So all I accumulate in, the, in, in my life, and just imagine my life is just a little tiny dot, just a tiny speck, because eternity is a continuous line that goes on and on and on and on forever. But way over here, this tiny little speck, 
I, I'm going to make it a little bigger. I'm going to blow that up. There it is. Oh, now I, we zeroed it on, on my spec. And I got all this stuff I've accumulated, right? And I've got the job I want, and I've got the position I want. I've got the money I want. I've got the retirement plan I want. I've got, I got it all. Let's remember, it's just a tiny speck. It's so limited. It is the here and now. And poof, it's gone. And now you're on, you're on the line. You're on the line of, of eternity. What you've done in this little tiny speck, what you believe, if you believe in the Lord Jesus Christ, you spend the eternal line above with God forever in heaven. If you have squandered the speck and you've rejected Christ and he doesn't rule and reign in your life, you're not a follower of Jesus, when this one goes poof, you're below the line in perdition forever and ever and ever. Whoa. Whoa. That's why I say financial gain is so limited. It's so finite. It's so small. And yet most of us, we spend most of our life striving for it, don't we? Don't we? Because money is limited, it's not the way to go. Because money tempts. People want to get rich, fall into temptation. It's amazing the things that people will do in order to get wealth. They will cave in on just about anything. A man was propositioning a beautiful woman, and he so happened to be a billionaire, and the billionaire was propositioning. The woman finally said, I'll give you a million dollars if you'll sleep with me. She thought for a moment and said, for a million dollars, one night, I can always ask for forgiveness later. She said, yes. He said, well, you know, I don't carry a million dollars in my pocket. He said, how about 100,000? And she thought for a moment, she said, 100,000 still good. She said, okay. He said, well, you know, really, truth is, I don't even have 100,000 on me, but I got 500. Would you uh, sleep with me for 500? She thought for a moment, sure could use that $500. Finally, he says to her, you know what? As he opened up his wallet, I don't even have 500. I got 50 bucks. Would you do it for 50? She said, what kind of woman do you think I am? He said, well, we've already established that. Now we're dickering over the price. And that's the way a lot of Christians, ooh, people fall into temptation. See, it's so tempting. Satan knows what green apple to stick out there. And sometimes it's the financial money one. Maybe it's a sexual interest. Maybe, you name it. Maybe it's a, a you just want peace from some kind of a, a, a drug, you know, an illegal drug that's going to give me a high in life. He knows exactly what to tempt you with. And he says, money. Money, that desire to become rich, brings with it great temptation and a trap. I got a little varmint at my house. It's a groundhog. It's a smart groundhog. I've set that trap. I don't know how he can get in there and get the bait and get out without getting trapped. You're going to have to help me, brother. <laughs> the squirrels get in there, and I, I did trap a squirrel the other day. He wasn't as clever as the groundhog. But sooner or later, I'm going to get that groundhog. And that's the way money works. Sooner or later, it sneaks up on you, and it takes and traps you. How does it trap you? Here's one of the ways it traps you with the money uh, and a credit card debt. Americans have like thousands of dollars that they roll over every month in credit card debt, paying interest, and all of that, and, and you're a slave. That's what the Bible says. The borrower is a slave to the lender. He's got you locked in their cell. It's credit card debt. And you think this is the answer to everything? It's not. It's not. Listen, money ruins. Money ruins. He says... Those people who want to get rich fall into temptations and a trap and into many foolish and harmful desires that plunge men into ruin and destruction. They take you down. They take you down. He goes on and says, then there's a money trouble. He says, for the love of money is the root of all kinds of evil. The love of money is the root of all kinds of evil. The love of money. The love of money. Well, how do I know? How do I know? if I have the love of money? How do I know? 
Well, Jesus helps us here. He does. For where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. Where are you spending your money? Tells you where your heart is. People say, well, I love the Lord with all my heart, with all my soul, with all my mind, just like the Bible says, I love him. And then I just ask this simple question, are you giving the Lord your full offering? He's giving you 100% of what you have, and he said, hey, just give back 10%, and you can have 90, and I'll bless your 90, so it'll take, take place of that 10th that you've given up. Uh, I'm just doing that to test your faith and your love to me, and for some reason, you look at what you give, and you say, boy, I just can't give that much, because why? I love my own life, my own prosperity, my own comfort, my own ease, that that money will buy me that I can't give it to God. Powerful. How do I know I have the love of money? Am I giving the Lord what he wants me to give him? Jesus said this, no one can serve two masters. Either he will hate the one and love the other, or he will be devoted to the one and despise the other. You cannot serve God and money. Ooh, that's a killer. If I can't give the Lord what he has asked me to give him, then I am serving money, not God. Wow. Wow. Money troubles. He says here, for the love of money is the root of all kinds of evil. Doesn't say that money is the root of all kinds of evil. That's really important because so often people will say, money is the, the, the root of all evil. It is not. It is the love of money that is the root of all evil. You can have a lot of money and love the Lord. Uh, there was a Several great, great uh, entrepreneurs who struck it really rich and gave the Lord a lot of money. Laterno, who did uh, the great earth-moving equipment, decided to reverse tithe his income. Give God 90% and just live off of 10. Whoa, is that amazing? Is that amazing? You cannot serve two masters. You cannot serve two masters. Money brings confusion. Some people who are eager for money have wandered from the faith. Why? They got their eyes on something other than Jesus Christ. And when they fixed their eyes on success, the corporate ladder, uh, they, on the market, and money, and investment, uh, they got to watch the market, they got to, whatever it is they got to do, that pulls them away from the Lord. They've wandered from the faith, and he says they have pierced themselves with many griefs. <laughs> he doesn't enumerate what the griefs are. I don't know what categories they come in. Maybe it is financial itself. In pursuing, they're on that rat race, and they're running and running, but everything's just spinning around and around and around and around, and they're getting nowhere. And they're getting tired of it. They're, they grieve it. Or maybe it pops up in some other area of life. They're always striving to get working constantly all the time and their family is suffering and they've got this grief in their heart. Maybe it's just spiritual. They have no time for God because they're always watching the market or their investments and they're always spending their time but never focusing on the Lord and the Word and prayer. And they bring upon themselves many griefs. Many griefs. Here's the point. It's not godly with finances that is great gain. It's not. It's not. But it's godliness with contentment is great gain. Because it is so, he says, therefore, flee. But you, man of God. Now, that's a, a term that is used to uh, very few people in the Bible. Moses was a man of God. Ezekiel was a man of God. Uh, Paul is calling Timothy, who's somewhere in his 40s, he calls him a young man, which means Paul's a little older, and he's telling this young man to flee from all this. What? The love of money. Don't go into the ministry for the cash. I, I, I'm amazed. You've probably seen on the internet these little ads pop up, show you about all these televangelists make and these mansions they live in and all the rest. But you, man of God, flee from all this. In Romans, I believe it's the 14th chapter, it says, dwell with ordinary, common ordinary people. It's not about being the elite 
flee all this love of money. He says, next, but you, you've got to pursue. Pursue righteous. What is right? What is just? That's what the term means, right? Righteous, just. Godliness. What is God like? We mentioned this last week about what would Jesus do? Those bracelets everybody used to wear, what would Jesus do? And I was to remind you, when, when I'm in a situation and it's tempting me, I ask myself, what would Jesus do? And then you do as Jesus would do. He says, pursue righteousness, godliness, faith. Some would have this as faithfulness. Be reliable, dependable, that God can, can count on you. Have faith. Love. This is the agape love, which is a sacrificial love where you're willing to die in someone else's place. Pursue what is right. Love of people. Endurance and gentleness. I got the finish line there because it's not about the start of the race. It's about the end of the race. The end of the race. Now, some years ago, I told you a story about when I had my 1932 Willys Oberlin. I was a teenager. My car was already an antique because I'm not that old, okay? <laughs> and I decided to take my 32 Willys down to the racetrack. I took it to Detroit Dragway, Sibley and Dix. And there I, I, I had my car and I was in it. Next to me was a car sponsored by the American Motors Corporation. It was a 1969 AMX. This thing had a supercharged engine. He was blowing flames out of the back exhaust as he pulled up to the Christmas tree. You know, the light goes yellow, 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 green, and then you hit it. He pulled up next to me, and I'm in my car, and he's in his car. He's revving it, and boom, the front end's popping off the ground, just getting lined up right, and they pour stuff on his tires so you get better grip. And when, when the Christmas tree went down, hit that green, he was gone. And there I was, just creeping. I, I, he was done. I never got out of first gear. He was done. He was like a nine-second car. There I was, driving along my 32 Willys. You know, his car was all streamlined, everything to, to make it to the end of the race. And, and, and there's my car. I got the windows down because it's a hot summer day. And the wind's blowing in. I can hear the announcer. And Elliot Ness is chasing Al Capone. He's mocking me. I cross that finish line finally, 32 seconds later. And they handed me a big trophy. I won. I have the trophy in my office. <laughs> I'm so proud of that trophy. You say, he must have disqualified himself. Nope, he didn't disqualify himself. Uh -uh. In fact, he got a trophy too. You see, we were in two different classes. And because he wasn't racing against me, he was just racing against himself. There was nobody else there in the classes we were in that day. So to save time, they raced us against each other. And I can say that I raced a 1969 AMX supercharged funny car and won the trophy. <laughs> I, all I had to do was not start incorrectly and just cross the finish line. Listen to me. That's the way it is with our faith. It's not how you start. It's how you finish. Pursue righteousness, godliness, faith, love, endurance, and gentleness. He said, do it. Then he says, fight. Fight the good fight of faith. Now, some people take this that we're fighting with one another. No, 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 no. The Apostle Paul makes that really clear. I do not fight like a man beating the air. I'm not shadow boxing. No, I beat my body and I make it a slave so that after I preach to others, I myself will not be disqualified from the prize. Listen. He is fighting to keep himself in line with the gospel that he pursues, and he's not disqualified, but he's qualified to receive the prize at the end, and here's the prize. Well done, good and faithful servant. That's what we hear Jesus say, well done, good and faithful servant. What a prize. What a prize. We fight. We fight to do what is right. He says, now, take hold. Hang on. Hang on. Take hold of eternal life to which you were called. Listen. He's saying, hang on to that which you were called. God called you to eternal life. Hang on to that. 
Remember the dot? In your life, he'd say, hang on, because once this life is over, boom, you've got the line. You're in heaven with God forever and ever and ever. Hang on, hold on. You were called to that. And you made good your confession. Remember the good confession? Peter made it, that you are the Christ, the Son of the living God. The good confession that Nate made today. Nate said, hey, I accepted Jesus Christ inside these four walls. One Sunday when we were preaching at the end, we gave the invitation. He prayed and he accepted Jesus Christ as his Savior. Isn't that awesome? He's saying, hey, that good confession in the presence of many witnesses, that's what he did today. He said, listen, I want you all to know I accepted Jesus Christ as my Savior. I put on the ring of baptism. Count me in with the Christians. The early Christians weren't called Christians. They were called people of the way. Jesus said, I am the way. And he's saying, I took Jesus' way. I'm on the way. I'm on the way to heaven because Jesus is the door. I went through the door. He says, listen, it's a great start, but make sure you cross the finish line. Finish well, finish well. Jumping to the second, Timothy, he's dealing with this false teacher right notion once again. He says, they will act religious. False teachers act religious. But they will reject the power that could make them godly. Stay away from people like that. Sometimes we just have to avoid those that would bring us down. We just have to avoid them. We avoid them. Godliness is great gain, but the text says, but godliness with contentment is great gain. Contentment. Contentment is great gain. So how do you get contentment? Well, first of all, it's learned. I know that from the Bible. The Apostle Paul says, he's gotten this gift from the church at Philippi, and he's writing back this thank you note. It's the book of Philippians in, in our Bible. And in this thank you note, he's saying, I'm not saying that, he's not saying it's thank yous to him, I'm not saying this because I am in need and want more, for I have learned to be content. There it is. It's kind of like people want, I want patience and I want it right now. I want contentment and I want it right now. No, it takes a process. You go through the school. And the school is the school of hard knocks. The school is a school of difficulty. The school of problems. You can't have it without going to school. I have learned to be content whatever the circumstances. Why can Paul say that? Because he knows Romans 8.28. God works everything together for good. I don't care what your circumstance is. Maybe you're in a financial difficulty. He's he's brought that about because he's working and he's going to ultimately work that for good. Maybe it's your health. God is ultimately going to work that for good. Uh, Maybe Paul, as he's writing this letter, he's incarcerated in prison, and he's he's rejoicing. Why? Because he knows somehow God is going to work this all together for good, and the ultimate good, he said, is to be absent from the bodies, be present of the Lord. He said, listen, I've learned to be content. Earlier in the book, he said, for to me to live is Christ, and to die is gain. There's my theme, gain, oh, gain. He said, listen, when you know Jesus, you can endure anything and everything because even the worst outcome, death, is gain. Isn't that amazing? That's why Christians aren't afraid. They're not afraid. Christians don't fear. Why? God has not given us a spirit of fear, but of power, love, and a sound mind. 2 Timothy 1.7. Wow. I have learned to be content, whatever the circumstance, because I know God is in control. I know what it is to be in need. I'd be without and want. And I know what it is to have plenty. He said, listen, I, I just enjoy the same, the life the same all the time. Do you ever wonder what you'd do if you won the lotto? I mean big, the billion dollar kind, you know? Everybody always says to me, well, first thing I do is pay off the church. And I say to them, church, it paid off. <laughs> okay, next. I mean, what, what, if you had all that money, how would it change your life? Paul says, listen, I've learned to be in want, and I've learned to have a lot. And you know what? For me, it's always about Jesus. Whether I have nothing or I have everything, I don't change. It's all about Jesus. All about Jesus. 
all about Jesus. He says, I have learned the secret. Oh, contentment is a secret. It's secretive. Not everybody is content in this world. Have you noticed that? <laughs> Not everybody is content. I have learned the secret. So what is it, Paul? I've learned the secret of being content in any and every situation while I'm in jail and prison in Philippi or whether I'm out preaching a sermon and lots of people are accepting my message. It doesn't matter what it is. Every situation, whether I'm well-fed, I've got a lot to eat, or I'm starving, I'm hungry, whether I'm living in plenty, I got the Cadillac version of a camel in his day. I got plenty. I, I, I'm living in a house, no longer a tent. I got plenty. Or if I'm in want, I'm shipwrecking. I'm out in the middle of the Mediterranean Sea trying to survive. He said, I know what it is like. He said, I got the secret to be content in every single situation. Don't you wish you had that? What is the secret, Paul? Give me the secret. Here it is. I can do everything through him who gives me strength. That's it. God never assigns anything so big that he doesn't enable me to handle. That's it. That's it. I've got the secret. No matter how bad it might be, if I trust in the Lord, I'll handle it. Doesn't mean I won't go through some pain, maybe, or I might have to, you know, uh, uh, get rid of some of my junk. But it does mean that I am strong. He infuses strength in me to get through everything in life. That's powerful. That's powerful. Therefore, he says, and I'm jumping to the book of Hebrews. The author of Hebrews in the 13th chapter says, Keep your lives free from the love of money. Not from the need for money, but from the love of money. That it's all about money because your life is more than about the money. Secondly, be content. Learn and grab hold of that secret. Be content with what you have right now. Right now. Right now. Why? Because God has said, Never will I leave you, never will I forsake you. That's a powerful promise. So you just trust God. You say, God, I'm trusting you. Just like Paul did in prison, just like Joseph of the Old Testament did in prison. I'm just trusting you, God. My circumstances are bad. When your circumstances are great, don't forget the Lord. That's what happens. God does bless you and he gives you abundance. And what do you do? Oh, I don't need God. I, and you put him on the shelf. It's like you pull God off the shelf when you need him, and then when you don't need him, you put him back on the shelf. He says, no, no. He's with me all the time. I will never leave you, and I will never forsake you. Therefore, he says, convince yourself. Say to yourself. You need to look yourself in the mirror, and you need to say, the Lord is my helper. I could make you all turn to each other and point your finger at them and say, the Lord is your helper, because you're not going to tell yourself, the Lord is my helper. The Lord is my helper. What will I, I, I will not be afraid. What can man do to me? The worst he can do is take my life and that's game. It's far better. Wow. This is great stuff. This is great stuff. Convince yourself of what Jesus said. For what will it profit a man if he gains the whole speck, the whole world, and loses his soul to perdition. What will a man give in exchange for his soul? Jesus gave everything. You, you give it all back to him. You live for him, and you gain everything. So what's the takeaway today? The takeaway is simply this. The greatest gain in life is not financial. We need to reprioritize ourselves. Finances is just one of those necessary things that you've got to have in order to make it through life, living for the glory of God. The goal is not the money. The goal is living for God. The money is to help you do that. Don't get those confused. You see what he says here? The greatest gain in life is having godliness in your life with contentment, satisfied. You're satisfied. You're just satisfied. But the truth is, you already knew that, didn't you? I didn't tell you one thing you didn't already know. 
I mean, you, tell, you, you know of all the movie stars that had it all and they couldn't cope with life and they took their own lives, don't you? The wealthy people, they got it all and they're never satisfied, never happy, they have no contentment, they have no peace. You see, I didn't, I didn't need to tell you all that. You already knew this, that the greatest gain in life is godliness with contentment. When you have that, wow. So today what I'm saying is I'm urging you to live what you already know. Live for Jesus. Live for Jesus. Live for Jesus. Amen? Let's pray. Father in heaven, we're thankful for these great things mentioned in the Bible. This one really reminds us what we already know. That great gain is not found in finances, but it is found in godliness with contentment that we get from Jesus. Lord, in a few minutes, we're going to celebrate the Lord's Supper. May we examine our hearts before we partake of it. And the Lord, to see if, uh, do I love you or do I love my money? I can't love both. You've got to be above it. Lord, if I do love my money more, I confess it, Lord. I repent and I will turn from this day and pursue you with all my heart and eternal life to hang on to it, to hold on to it, to finish the race, to finish the course, to cross the finish line and hear, well done, good and faithful servant. Prepare our hearts, Lord, for communion with you at the Lord's table. In Jesus' name, amen.